Hello students, uh, today we'll be doing the current affairs for uh, the 6th of March. Now the first topic that we'll be discussing will be the no-fly zone that uh, has been refused by the West uh, over Ukraine. Okay, and then the next topic that we'll discuss is the condition of FATF which has uh, still retained Pakistan over in the grey list. Also, we'll uh, discuss about IMF, the data protection bill, which has been there in the news for a very long time, uh, the NCPCR, National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, and Voter Islands, which is a problem in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. The first topic that we'll be discussing is the no-fly zone over Ukraine. Okay, So, the reason why it is in the news is because uh, the Russia's attack on the nuclear power plant, like what we had discussed yesterday, has renewed calls for NATO to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine, despite the repeated rejection of the idea by Western leaders concerned about triggering a wider war in Europe. So there are tensions that imposing a no-fly zone over Europe, over uh, Ukraine, I'm sorry, will lead to further escalation of the war and it can lead to a World War II situation. This is the reason why the West does not want to impose a no-fly zone in Ukraine, despite the Ukrainian president asking for a no-fly zone to be imposed. Now, now what is this no-fly zone? No-fly zone in simple terms means that NATO will deploy its missiles or its uh, people in the region in order to prevent any unauthorized flight of any objects, let it be missiles, let it be unmanned aerial vehicles, let it be drones, flights, aircrafts, anything. So, a no-fly zone would bar all unauthorized aircrafts from flying over Ukraine. This no-fly zone was also imposed earlier over Libya when Mr. Gaddafi was removed from powers. Okay. Uh, and also several other countries like say for example, Serbia when Milosevic was uh, ruling. Uh, that time a no-fly zone was uh, imposed over Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. Now, Western nations imposed such restrictions over parts of Iraq for more than a decade following the 1991 Gulf War and during the civil war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and during the Libyan civil war in 2011. Okay, why doesn't the West want to impose a nuclear civil war? And why doesn't the West want to impose a no-fly zone? I'm sorry. The reasons are, USA, Britain and the European allies are skeptical about imposing a no-fly zone because it could escalate into a proper war in Ukraine. It could result in a nuclear confrontation because as you know, Russia has the highest number of nuclear weapons which are active. Declaring a no-fly zone would force NATO pilots to shoot down Russian aircrafts because when Russian aircrafts are flying over Ukraine in order to bomb it normally in case this imposing of a no-fly zone over Ukraine would mean that NATO, NATO forces and NATO missiles have to shoot down these Russian aircrafts and this could further lead into a proper war. In addition to fighter planes, NATO would also have to deploy refueling tankers electronic surveillance aircraft in order to support this no-fly zone. To protect these relatively slow, high-flying high flying planes, NATO would have to destroy the surface-to-air missile batteries in Russia and Belarus, which will risk a war. Now, in order to support these surveillance aircraft, uh, NATO will have to destroy these uh, surface-to-air missiles. Otherwise, what will Russia do? Russia has surface-to-air missiles which can counter these surveillance aircrafts. Hence, uh, USA or NATO countries have to destroy these surface-to-air missiles which could again trigger into a big-scale war. And that is the reason why Western leaders don't want to impose a no-fly zone. Now, what would a no-fly zone achieve? Ukrainian authorities and people covering, covering night after night in bomb shelters say that a no-fly zone would protect civilians and nuclear power stations from Russian airstrikes. So having a nuclear, uh, having a no-fly zone can protect uh, 
you know people of ukraine and the nuclear power plants from constant uh, missiles from russian aircrafts is what the ukrainian people believe and that is the reason why they have been pushing for a no fly zone now please uh, see the geography of ukraine once what are the important mountain ranges what are the important uh, rivers that flow over there plateaus all these physical properties and also political properties uh, like say for example what are the neighboring countries uh, the countries that have a border with ukraine are belarus poland then uh, slovakia then romania hungary and then moldova and then finally russia so these are the countries which have a border with ukraine 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 seven countries are there okay please remember uh, all the countries that have a border with uh, ukraine also try to remember some of the most important cities of ukraine uh like the capital kyiv then the second largest city which is kharkiv and then luhansk donetsk some of the places which are very very important okay next moving on fatf retains pakistan on the terror funding gray list now why is the why is it there in the news the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog fatf has retained pakistan on its terrorism financing gray list and asked islamabad to address at the earliest the remaining deficiencies in its financial system the fatf still believes that whatever the steps are which have been taken by pakistan in order to prevent terrorist financing are not enough and hence it has retained pakistan on the gray list of the fatf itself since earlier since then since when the fatf put pakistan on the gray list the country continues to be on that list due to its failure to comply with all the fatf mandates fatf decided against exiting pakistan from the category despite the country meeting 32 out of the 34 action points okay because pakistan has not met the rest two action points it is not being let out of the gray list now however the other good thing about pakistan is that it has been making several steps in order to uh, prevent terrorist financing pakistan's robust uh, progress on its global commitments to fight financial crimes was appreciated which noted that pakistan had completed 26 of the 27 action items in its 2018 action plan of the fatf for completing most of the seven action items of 2021 action plan of the asia uh, of the watchdogs asia pacific group on money laundering so there are 27 action points over here in the 2018 uh, plan of fatf and seven action points of the uh, fatf asia pacific asia pacific group asia pacific group so out of these uh, 34 pakistan has met 32 currently okay so what we need to know about fatf is that fatf is an intergovernmental organization and it was created in 1989 by the g7 initially it was created just to combat money laundering and prevent money laundering across various jurisdictions however later on in the year 2001 its mandate mandate expanded to terrorist financing also prevention of terrorist financing its secretariat is at oecd headquarters in paris it monitors the implementation through peer reviews which means that all the countries which are a part of fatf will come together to monitor other countries they themselves will be doing it now india most of the you know deliberations of fatf are conducted in a very informal manner okay now one more thing about the fatf is that india became an observer of the grouping in 2006 and it was later inducted as a full time member only in the year 2010 fatf depends upon voluntary implementation of its reports by member countries however 
say for example now pakistan is there even though there is only voluntary uh, implementation of the reports there is no definite compulsory implementation of recommendations of fatf on pakistan yet if pakistan is placed on the gray list then all the other countries will be skeptical about investing in pakistan it will reduce the investments that pakistan gets and that's the reason why uh, you know countries are scared of fatf also meetings of the group are carried out behind closed doors and deliberations are not publicized decisions are made on a consensus basis not individual basis consensus basis as they conduct reviews of the countries on anti money laundering and counter financing of terrorism these are known as mutual evaluations they are conducted all the decisions are made on consensus basis and uh, they have peer reviews of countries on anti money laundering and countering terrorist financing which are known as all these uh, things are known as mutual evaluations and then either they clear them or use a color coded reference for countries okay monitored jurisdictions category is the official name for gray list countries these are the countries that actually have uh, terrorist financing or we also have an other category called as the high risk jurisdictions or the call for action category which is known as the black list countries now this is worse than the gray list so this is known as the officially it's known as the monitored jurisdictions while black list countries are known as the high risk jurisdictions okay now pakistan is one of the 18 countries on the gray list while iran and north korea are known as the black list countries they are high risk jurisdictions like what we spoke next imf warns of serious global economic impact the reason why uh, the imf is in the news is because the imf had warned that the already serious global economic impacts of the war in ukraine would be all the more devastating if the conflict becomes even bigger we can see that yesterday that the crude oil prices have increased to 110 dollars 112 dollars similarly coal prices have increased as compared to one year ago prices uh, similarly even edible oil prices have increased natural gas prices have increased component uh, i mean items of uh, food such as wheat have increased okay no no even as forecasts remain subject to extraordinary uncertainty the economic consequences of the invasion that has been launched by russia are very serious according to imf we spoke about the surge in energy and commodity prices prices of copper has increased prices of coal of uh, oil has increased they have piled on to the inflationary hike that the world was already experiencing we know that there is a heavy amount of inflation in the world even in india we spoke that the retail inflation uh the consumer price index had crossed 6.1% while the inflation in the usa has hit around 7.5% so most of the world uh, countries around the world are experiencing high inflation and to add to that you know because of the shortage of supply uh the prices are also increasing again this can put more pressure on inflation and cause inflation to increase which is already high now what is imf IMF is nothing but an organization of 189 member countries uh and this particular organization it has certain objectives such as fostering global monetary cooperation securing financial stability facilitating international trade promoting high employment and sustainable economic growth and reducing poverty around the world these are the objectives of the IMF also each of the 189 member countries of the imf has a representation on the imf's executive board things one of the most important roles of the imf is to provide currency in terms of liquidity crisis whenever there is a, a balance of payments crisis whenever in the case of balance of payments crisis then imf provides for currency that is the main role of the imf okay uh 
it also uh, ensures that the system of exchange rates and the international payments are working properly okay now the other functions of the imf are that the imf okay the imf was actually conceived at a un conference in bretton woods and hence uh, it's also known as the bretton wood institution the other institution bretton wood institution is a uh, the world bank okay uh, countries uh, are not eligible for membership of the international bank for reconstruction and development unless they are members of imf okay now please uh, this international bank for reconstruction and development is one of the units of the world bank okay the other units are international development assistance and there exist around three more units the world bank has five units under it okay please uh, go through all of them ibrd ida then icsid yeah and so on please read all these different units under the world bank the headquarters are in new york itself now the most important thing about imf is the imf uh, quotas now what are these quotas imf itself is a quota based institution quotas are the building blocks of imf and they provide all the financial aid through quota system quotas are the building blocks of the imf's financial and governance structure and individual member countries quota broadly reflects its relative position in the world economy okay countries that have a larger gdp or with a larger economic importance they have larger quotas quotas are denominated in this thing called the special drawing rights also known as sdrs the quotas are increased periodically as a means of boosting the imf's resources in the form of special drawing rights now quotas are very important the quotas not only reflect how much a country has to contribute to the imf but quotas also show how much a country receives from the imf in terms of special drawing rights now uh, what is the importance of a quota it ensures resource contributions quotas determine the maximum amount of financial resources a member is obliged to provide to the imf like what we spoke voting power quotas are a determinant of the voting power of imf okay now access to financing quotas determine the maximum amount of financing a member can obtain from the imf and uh, quotas also determine the sdr share so quotas are basically the units the basic working units of the imf now what are special drawing rights and how are they calculated special drawing rights are a supplementary foreign exchange reserve asset defined and maintained by the international monetary fund say for example uh, uh, a country has short term liquidity crisis it doesn't have enough amount of foreign exchange in that case it can use these sdrs for foreign trade these are a, these are a form of uh, there, these are a unit that is maintained by the imf okay and uh, these units actually their value of these units is defined by a weighted currency basket of major currencies such as the us uh, us dollar the euro the british pound the chinese yuan and the japanese yen all these currencies put together is what determine the uh, value of one sdr sdr and each country has a particular quota of these sdrs which it can use for trade central banks of member countries hold sdrs with imf which can be used by them to access funds from the imf in case of financial crisis in the domestic market uh, however please remember that sdr is not an outright currency yes okay uh, also in the case of india India's quota in the IMF is SDR 13114 million which gives India a shareholding of 2.76%. Earlier India had a lower uh, uh, quota in the IMF it had around 2.3%. Now this has increased because of the increase in India's GDP and global heft. India's uh, quotas at the IMF have increased to 2.76%. 
This makes India the eighth largest quota holding country at the organization. In the year 2000, India completed repayment of all the loans that it had taken from the IMF. Now, moving on, data protection bill. Uh, we know that data is a very important component which has been in the news time and again. Uh, even the Supreme Court in the Putta Sami case, Putta Sami case had declared that right to privacy is a fundamental right of the citizens under Article 21. Now, uh, why is it in the news currently? The government has said that it is studying the inputs received on the draft data protection bill and it will ensure that any legislation in the digital ecosystem will act as an enabler fueling the growth momentum. Earlier we know that on December 16th, 2021, the Joint Committee on Personal Data Protection Bill. This bill had been introduced and uh, there was a joint committee which was formed to study the provisions of this Personal Data Protection Bill. So this joint committee had tabled its report in both the houses of the parliament. Now the government is actually going through these recommendations right now and it is uh, studying them. Nearly two years after it was constituted, on 11th December 2019, the Joint Committee on the Personal Data Protection Bill presented its final report on 16th December 2021. Now, what were the recommendations of this committee? Now, before this, you need to know some of the provisions of the Data Protection Bill. Okay. Now, some of the provisions of this Data Protection Bill are that it categorizes data into three particular types. Now, uh, such as personal data, critical personal data, and sensitive personal data. Personal data, sensitive data, sensitive personal data, and critical personal data. Now, uh, personal data is nothing but what uh, an individual can be identified with, such as name, address and all. Now, sensitive personal data are some types of personal data like financial data, health data, biometric data, genetic data, etc. And critical personal data is anything that the government deems is critical personal data, such as military data, national security data, etc. Okay. Now, uh, the, uh, the bill also, the draft data protection bill of 2019 also talks about establishing a data protection authority, data protection authority in order to uh, regulate data, use of data, protection authority, okay, DPA. Uh, the data, the bill also states that critical personal data has to be stored and processed in India itself. Stored and processed in India itself. So, many provisions are there in this particular bill. Please go through all the important provisions. Uh, the critical personal data has to be uh, stored and processed in India itself. And then it talks about social media companies. Uh, it requires the social media companies which are significant data fiduciaries to develop their own user verification mechanism. They want social media companies to be more accountable and develop their own user uh, verification mechanism to remove uh, unauthorized usage or to, uh, to remove anonymous usage. Also, uh, for uh, the bill also provides exemptions for processing data without an individual's consent for reasonable purposes, including when the security of the state is concerned. So even without the acceptance of the individual, data of the individual can be used for security of the state, then detection of any fraud, etc. Okay. But this has to be authorized by the Data Protection Authority. 
now each uh, social media company will also have this uh, data protection officer who works along with this data protection authority for auditing of data and all of that okay please read the other provisions of the data protection bill there are several several provisions however some of the recommendations of the joint committee regarding the data protection bill is to remove the word personal from the existing title of personal data protection this is intended to reflect that the bill in order to ensure privacy will also deal with non personal data such as personal data that has become anonymous by removing you know personal information it has to protect all sorts of information hence this personal word is you know is sought to be removed amend the section restricting the transfer of personal data outside india to say sensitive personal data shall not be shared with any foreign government or agency unless such sharing is approved by the central government okay now the the committee has given a recommendation saying that like we spoke about personal data sensitive personal data and then critical personal data right sensitive personal data will include health records uh, you know the biometric uh, details all of that so the committee has said that this particular data should not be shared with any foreign government unless such sharing is approved by the central government itself also no social media platform will be allowed to operate in india unless its parent company which co- controls the technology powering its services sets up an office within the country it proposes a separate regulatory body to set up to regulate the media also okay the central government may exempt any government agency from the legislation only under exceptional circumstances these are the recommendations that the joint committee has given to the existing data protection bill now moving on national commission for protection of shale rights the reason why it is in the news is because it uh, celebrated its 17th foundational day because the Na- national commission for protection of shale rights was set up in march 2007 after this particular act came in the commissions for protection of child rights act of 2005 the commission began to operate however only in 2007 hence this ncpcr is nothing but a statutory body under the control of ministry of women and child development the commission's mandate is to ensure that all laws policies programs and administrative mechanisms are in consonance with the child right perspectives as given in the constitution of india and under under the un convention on the rights of the child definition of a child is that under the commissions for the protection of child rights act the child is defined as any person below the age of 18 years Uh, what are the different functions of the national uh, commission for protection of child rights under the rte act of 2009 okay not under this particular act of 2005 but rather under the rte act of 2009 the ncpcr can inquire into complaints about violation of any law summon an individual and demand evidence and seek a magisterial inquiry into any violation file a writ petition in the high court or the supreme court approach the government concerned for prosecution of any offender and recommend interim relief to those affected so these are the powers and functions of the ncpcr now this ncpcr comprises of one chairperson and six members of which at least two should be women and they are appointed by the central government for 3 years the maximum age to serve in the commission is 65 years and 60 years for members 65 years for chairperson okay moving on voter islands now first of all we spoke about delimitation commission earlier we said that uh, you know the center central government has uh, appointed a delimitation commission under uh, retired uh, chi- retired judge of the supreme court miss uh, ranjana prakash desai uh, for delimitation of various constituencies in jammu and kashmir currently that is the thing uh also uh, this particular uh, delimitation commission it comprises of one member from the election commission and uh, the state uh, election commissioner okay along with uh, miss desai ranjana prakash desai 
Okay, we saw that uh, this particular commission had given its interim report some time back. We had discussed it earlier on the 7th of February. Now, some of the provisions of those interim report were that uh, it has suggested adding seven assembly seats, seven assembly seats to Jammu and Kashmir. Out of these, six seats would be for Jammu and one seat in the case of Kashmir. Okay. This would increase the number of seats existing from around uh, uh, to 90 from the existing 83. So, those seven seats, uh, six would be in Jammu and one would be in Kashmir. Okay. Uh, okay. And also, uh, the commission one more of its interim recommendation was to provide nine seats for scheduled castes and uh, sorry for scheduled tribes and seven seats for scheduled castes. Okay, uh, out of the total number of seats which are there, out of the ninety seats, the commission has also suggested redrawing the boundaries of most of the assembly seats of Jammu and Kashmir. That was the third recommendation. Most of the assembly seats have to be redrawn. It has also proposed as the fourth recommendation to have an additional one extra Lok Sabha seat, which will comprise of a significant proportion of non Kashmiri speaking scheduled tribes. Okay. Now, why is the delimitation uh, commission in the news or why are these water islands in news? Okay, a lot of political leaders of Jammu and Kashmir who are participating in the delimitation commission in Jammu and Kashmir as well as independent observers have raised this fear of independent water islands being formed. What is the issue? The delimitation act of 2002 says that apart from population, the constituencies have to be compact areas. They have to be continuous areas. Constituencies need to be continuous. You can't have different, different, uh, you know, parts of the constituency here, here, and uh, you can't say that all these units form one constituency this can't happen observers say that this principle is not being followed currently in the current delimitation exercise a village in one tehsil would be completely surrounded by villages from another tehsil okay geographical connectedness is not being considered over here according to many of these observers this actually gives rise to water islands now the commission has carved out geographical islands and joined them with other assembly segments without any proximity or connectivity they are saying that this particular one unit or one village has to be a part of this assembly constituency which is not continuous with it and that is not proper. Okay, now the delimitation commission, uh, what is this exercise in Jammu and Kashmir? In 2020, the delimitation commission was constituted to carry out the exercise on the basis of 2011 census with a mandate to add seven more seats to the union territory and grant reservations to the SCST communities. Like what we spoke? Six seats in Jammu. Uh, we spoke about the interim report just now. One seat in Kashmir. Now, these 90 assembly seats are apart from the 24 seats which have been reserved for areas of POK and have been kept vacant in the assembly itself. Now, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. This includes this region known as Gilgit Baltistan and another region known as Azad Kashmir currently. These uh, units actually account for around 24 seats. And since Pakistan is in occupation of this region, these 24 seats have been left vacant. Hence, uh, though uh, the Jammu and Kashmir assembly has more number of assembly seats, only 90 seats are actually filled with uh, regular elections. Thank you.